Reservoir Dogs is a masterpiece. For his directorial debut, Tarantino hit it out of the park with a tense, gripping and expertly paced film, crammed with fantastic performances and quotable lines, which made it one of the most influential independent films ever released. And yet the film had a shaky start which could have prevented it from having the impact that it did upon the independent film industry. Written by Tarantino in just three weeks, the script was his attempt to break away from his previous successes as a screenwriter for True Romance and Natural Born Killers, both of which he had originally written with the intention to direct before they were optioned and given to other directors. The film was produced by Tarantino alongside Lawrence Bender, whom he had met in 1990 whilst he was struggling to get Reservoir Dogs bankrolled. Bender had previously produced the 1989 film Intruder, featuring Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, and he was keen to ensure that he didn't go back to his old career as an on-set grip. He had written it in three and a half weeks, and it was amazing, recalls Bender. The dialogue was incredible. I told him I could raise money for this. He didn't know. I'd never raise money for anything. Lawrence had told Tarantino he would finance the film in a year. Tarantino told him two months, three months tops. Initial interest came from producer, director Monty Hellman, who had directed the Jack Nicholson western Ride in the Whirlwind. Monty was enthusiastic, in fact he liked the film so much he wanted to direct it himself. Lawrence knew however that this wasn't an option. After losing True Romance and Natural Born Killers, there was no way that Tarantino would want to hand over the film to another director. The idea of an unknown directing Reservoir Dogs led Monty to be sceptical upon meeting Tarantino, but he was impressed by his level of enthusiasm, so much so that he offered to mortgage his house alongside some land he owned in Texas to finance the film. Progressively, Lawrence found better offers. I found a video company with half a million dollars, recalled Lawrence, and then another investor up in Canada with half a million dollars, but only if his girlfriend could play Mr. Blonde. An idea so left field that Tarantino and Lawrence nearly considered it. The Canadian investor also pressured Quinton and Lawrence to change the film's ending, arguing that as the film was like Raising Arizona, yes, Raising Arizona, it needed a happy ending. They were offered 1.6 million, enough to finance the film entirely, to change the ending and have all of the characters live, but neither Tarantino nor Bender would budge. They were willing to shoot the movie themselves on a shoestring if it meant retaining artistic freedom. Funding was just a bonus. The film's big break came through Lawrence's association with Peter Flood, who was divorced from acting teacher Lily Parker. It had been Quinton's dream to get Keitel involved with the film, and as a favour, Flood passed on the script to Parker, who knew Harvey Keitel from the actor's studio. One evening, Lawrence returned home to find a voicemail message on his machine from the man himself, which said, this is Harvey Cartel calling. I read Reservoir Dogs, and I would love to talk to you about it. <laughs> that's uh, an exact, um, an exact recording from the. That's that's, that's the transcript. Uh, <clears throat> Keitel brought more to the table than his acting chops. Motivated by his desire to help young filmmakers break into the industry, Keitel was fundamental to the film's casting process, allowing Lawrence and Quinton to travel to New York and he eventually became one of the film's producers. The other big break came from Monty Hellman's association with Rich Gladstein, Vice President of Production at Live Entertainment, a video company who doubled as an independent financer. Like Lily Parker had done for Keitel, Monty dropped off the script for Reservoir Dogs at Rich's house, and within days he was in touch with the team. Unlike most people initially interested in the film, Gladstein didn't have a problem with Tarantino's status as a first-time director, stating that he always intended to make the film unless the guy was a complete idiot. Gladstein and his partner, Rona B. Wallace, initially offered the team $1.3 million, but they were eventually persuaded by Lawrence to bump the offer to $1.6 million, on the promise that the extra money would result in a far superior product. The film had overcome the earlier challenges of convincing investors not to deviate from Tarantino's vision, and just before filming began, Tarantino was offered a chance to work on the film at the Sundance Film Lab. Going against accepted practice, Tarantino discarded the material he had prepared to shoot upon arrival and decided to write a completely new scene on the fly. The scene in question involved a discussion between Joe and Mr. Pink, in which Joe recounts his girlfriend trying to get him to read The Bell Jar, but the scene was ultimately pulled from the film due to complications of the Plath estate. In terms of filming, besides the warehouse being intensely hot, a sensation amplified by the fact that all of the actors were in suits, the shooting actually went off relatively problem-free, wrapping briskly in under five weeks. However, 
The film encountered a major setback during its first screening at Sundance. Shot in widescreen, the film required an anamorphic lens to prevent the image from looking squashed, alongside an aperture plate to ensure that it fits the dimensions of the screen. On the night of the premiere, the projectionist did not have the correct aperture plate, and the film bled onto the curtains, making half of the film's scenes incomprehensible. Filmmaker Alexander Rockwell recalls that fondly. Quinton was freaking out in the background. He was screaming and walking down the aisle, yelling, stop, I can't take this. This is the first public screening of the only film I've ever made. You don't understand. This is horrible. However, the film still attracted buzz, despite winning no prizes, and as a result, soon attracted the attention of Miramax, who secured the rights to distribute the film in North America. Its screening at numerous festivals, such as Cannes, resulted in numerous walkouts, including a famous walkout by Wes Craven at the Stiges Horror Festival, and the critical response, whilst positive, focused heavily on the film's violence and bad language, which may have contributed to the fact that the film grossed only a modest $3 million during its domestic theatre release. And yet, the film eventually recovered. It soldiered on, bolstered by the success of Tarantino's juggernaut, Pulp Fiction, to sell 900,000 VHS copies. Reservoir Dogs' legacy is evident through its sharp dialogue, great performances, and memorable scenes. And yet, throughout its production, there was so much room for things to go wrong, time and time again. Under a less principled team, we could have seen a film drastically altered to the one we have, with a happy ending, a completely different Mr. Blonde, and a different director in order to appease investors. Likewise, its disastrous premiere could have seen the film plunged into obscurity, a simple entry on a Wikipedia page for films released in 1992. But thankfully, none of that happened. Neither of those things were the case, none of that came to pass, and Reservoir Dogs continues to stake its claim as one of the most important and influential independent films of all time. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Full Fat Videos. Whether it be video essays, movie pitches, retrospectives, or our weekly Doc2 discussion show, you can find it all here at our channel. So don't forget to subscribe and follow us on MySpace. I mean Twitter.